Chapter 12 of All Roads Lead to Calvary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Yoganan All Roads Lead to Calvary by Jerome K. Jerome Chapter 12 She reached home in the evening. In the Phillips' old rooms, had been twice lit since Christmas, but were now again empty. The McKean, with his silent ways and his everlasting pipe, had gone to America to superintend the production of one of his plays. The house gave her the feeling of being haunted. She had a dinner brought up to her and prepared for a long evening's work, but found herself unable to think, except on the one subject that she wanted to put off thinking about. To her relief, the last post brought her a letter from Arthur, he had been called to Lisbon to look after a contract and would be away for a fortnight. Her father was not as well as he had been. It seemed to just fit in. She would run down and spend a few quiet days at Liverpool, in an old familiar room where the moon peeped in over the tops of the tall pines. She would be able to reason things out. Perhaps her father would be able to help her. She had lost her childish conception of him as of someone prim and proper with cut and dried formulas for all occasions. That glimpse he had shown her of himself had established a fellowship between them. He too had wrestled with life's riddles, not sure of his own answers. She found him suffering from his old heart trouble, but more cheerful than she had known him for years. Arthur seemed to be doing wonders with the men. They were coming to trust him. The difficulty I have always been up against, explained her father, has been their suspicion. What's the cunning old rascal up to now? What's his little game? That's always what I have felt they were thinking to themselves whenever I wanted to do anything for them. It isn't anything he says to them. It seems to be just he himself. He sketched out their plans to her. It seemed to be all going in at one year and out the other. What was the matter with her? Perhaps she was tired without knowing it. She would get him to tell her all about it tomorrow. Also tomorrow, she would tell him about Phillips and ask his advice. It was really quite late. If he talked any more now, it would give her a headache. She felt it coming on. She made a good night extra affectionate, hoping to disguise her impatience. She wanted to get up to her own room. But even that did not help her. It seemed in some mysterious way to be no longer her room, but the room of someone she had known and half forgotten, who would never come back. It gave her the same feeling she had experienced on returning to the house in London, that the place was haunted. The high shovel glass from her mother's dressing room had been brought there for her use. The picture of an absurdly small child, the child to whom this room had once belonged, standing before it, naked, rose before her eyes. She had wanted to see herself. She had thought that while her clothes stood in the way, if we could but see ourselves as in some magic mirror, all the garments usage and education has dressed us up and laid aside. What was she underneath the artificial niceties her prim moralities, her laboriously acquired restraints, her unconscious pretenses and hypocrisies. She changed her clothes for a loose robe and putting out the light, drew back the curtains. The moon peeped in over the top of the tall pines, but it only stared at her, indifferent. It seemed to be looking for somebody else. Suddenly, and intensely to her own surprise, she fell into a passionate fit of weeping. There was no reason for it, and it was altogether so unlike her. But for quite a while, she was unable to control it. Gradually, and of their own accord, her sobs lessened, and she was able to wipe her eyes and take stock of herself in the long glass. She wondered for the moment whether it was really her own reflection that she saw there, or that of some ghostly image of her mother. She had so often seen the same look in her mother's eyes. Evidently, the likeness between them was more extensive than she had imagined. For the first time, she became conscious of an emotional, hysterical side to her nature, of which she had been unaware. Perhaps it was just as well that she had discovered it. She would have to keep a stricter watch upon herself. This question of her future relationship with Phillips, it would have to be thought out coldly, dispassionately. Nothing unexpected must be allowed to enter into it. It was some time before she fell asleep. The high glass faced her as she lay in bed. She could not get away from the idea that it was her mother's face that every now and then she saw reflected there. She woke late the next morning. Her father had already left for the works. She was rather glad to have no need of talking. 
she would take a long walk into the country and face the things quietly with the help of the cheerful sun and the free west wind that was blowing from the sea. She took the train up north and struck across the hills. Her spirits rose as she walked. It was only the intellectual part of him she wanted. The spirit, not the man. She would be taking nothing away from the woman, nothing that had ever belonged to her, all the rest of him his home life, the benefits that would come to her from his improved means, from his social position, all that the woman had ever known or cared for in him would still be hers. He would still remind to her the kind husband and father. What more was the woman capable of understanding? What more had she any right to demand? It was not of herself she was thinking. It was for his work's sake that she wanted to be near to him, that she might counsel him, encourage him, for this, she was prepared to sacrifice herself, give up a woman's claim on life. They would be friends, comrades, nothing more. The little lurking curiosity of hers concerning what it would be like to feel his strong arms round her, pressing her closer and closer to him, it was only a foolish fancy. She could easily laugh that out of herself. Only bad women had need to be afraid of themselves. She would keep guard for both of them. Their purity of motive, the high purpose, would save them from the danger of anything vulgar or ridiculous. Of course, they would have to be careful. There must be no breath of gossip, no foot for evil tongues. About that, she was determined even more for his sake than her own. It would be fatal to his career. She was quite in agreement with the popular demand, supposed to be peculiarly English, that a public man's life should be above reproach. Of what use these prophets without self-control? These social reformers who could not shake the ape out of themselves? Only the brave could give courage to others. Only through the pure could God's light shine upon men. It was vexing his having moved round the corner into North Street. Why couldn't the silly woman have been content where she was? Living under one roof, they could have seen one another as often as was needful without attracting attention. Now, she supposed, she would have to be more than ever the bosom friend of Mrs. Phillips. Spend hours amid the tedious furniture, surrounded by those bilious wallpapers. Of course he could not come to her. She hoped he would appreciate the sacrifice she would be making for him. Fortunately, Mrs. Phillips would give no trouble. She would not even understand. What about Hilda? No hope of hiding the secret from those sharp eyes. But Hilda would approve. They could trust Hilda. The child might prove helpful. It cast a passing shadow upon her spirits, this necessary descent into details. It brought with it the suggestion of intrigue, of deceit, robbing the thing to a certain extent of its fineness. Still, what was to be done? If women were coming into public life, these sort of relationships with men would have to be faced and worked out. Sex must no longer be allowed to interfere with the working together of men and women for common ends. It was that had kept the world back. They would be pioneers of the new order. Casting aside their earthly passions, humbly, with pure hearts, they would kneel before God's altar. He should bless their union. A lark was singing. She stood listening. Higher and higher he rose, pouring out a song of worship, till the tiny, fragile body disappeared as if fallen from him, leaving his sweet soul still singing. The happy tears came to her eyes and she passed on. She did not hear that little last faint sob with which he sank exhausted back to earth beside a hidden nest among the furrows. She had forgotten the time. It was already late afternoon. Her long walk and the keen air had made her hungry. She had a couple of eggs with a tea at a village inn and was fortunate enough to catch a train that brought her back in time for dinner. A little ashamed of her unresponsiveness the night before, she laid herself out to be sympathetic to her father's talk. She insisted on hearing again all that he and Arthur were doing, opposing him here and there with criticism just sufficient to stimulate him, careful in the end to let him convince her. These small hypocrisies were new to her. She hoped she was not damaging her character. But it was good, watching him slyly from under drawn-down lids, to see the flash of triumph that would come into his tired eyes in answer to a half-protesting, Yes, I see your point. I hadn't thought of that a half-reluctant admission that perhaps he was right there, and perhaps she was wrong. It was delightful to see him young again, eager, boyishly pleased with himself. It seemed there was a joy she had not dreamed of in yielding victory 
as well as in gaining it. A new tenderness was growing up in her. How considerate, how patient, how forgetful he had always been. She wanted to mother him, to take him in her arms and croon over him, hushing every remembrance of the old sad days. Folk's words came back to her. And poor Jack Alway. Tell him I thank him for all those years of love and gentleness. She gave him the message. Folk had been right. He was not offended. Dear old chap, he said. That was kind of him. He was always generous. He was silent for a while with a quiet look on his face. Give him our love, he said. Tell him we came together at the end. It was on her tongue to ask him, as so often she had meant to do off late, what had been the cause of mother's illness, if illness it was, what it was that happened to change both their lives. But always something had stopped her, something ever-present, ever-watchful, that seemed to shape itself out of the air, bending towards her with its finger on its lips. She stayed over the weekend, and on the Saturday at a suggestion, they took a long excursion into the country. It was the first time she had ever asked him to take her out. He came down to breakfast in a new suit and was quite excited. In the car, his hand had sought hers shyly and feeling a responsive pressure, he had continued to hold it and they had sat for a long time in silence. She decided not to tell him about Phillips just yet. He knew of him only from the Tory newspapers and would form a wrong idea. She would bring them together and leave Phillips to make his own way. He would like Phillips when he knew him she felt sure. He too was a people's man. The torch passed down to him from his old Ironside ancestors had still glowed. More than once she had seen it leap to flame. In congenial atmosphere, it would burn clear and steadfast. It occurred to her what a delightful solution of a problem if later on a father could be persuaded to leave Arthur in charge of the works and come to live with her in London. There was a fine block of flats near Chelsea Church with long views up and down the river. How happy they could be there. The drawing room in the Adam style with wine-coloured curtains. He was a father any young woman could be proud to take about. Unconsciously, she gave his hand an impulsive squeeze. They lunched at an old inn upon the moors, and the landlady, judging from his shy, attentive ways, had begun by addressing her as Madame. You grow wonderfully like your mother, he told her that evening at dinner. There used to be something missing, but I don't feel that now. She wrote to Phillips to meet her, if possible, at Euston. There were things she wanted to talk to him about. There was the question whether she should go on writing for Carlton or break with him at once. Also, one or two points that were worrying her in connection with tariff reform. He was waiting for her on the platform. It appeared he too had much to say. He wanted her advice concerning his next speech. He had not dined and suggested supper. They could not walk about the streets. Likely enough, it was only her imagination, but it seemed to her that people in the restaurant had recognized him and were whispering to one another. He was bound to be well known. Likewise, her own appearance, she felt, was against them as regarded their desire to avoid observation. She would have to take to those mousy colors that did not suit her and wear a veil. She hated the idea of a veil. It came from the east and belonged there. Besides, what would be the use? Unless he wore one too. Who is the whale woman that Phillips goes about with? That is what they would ask. It was going to be very awkward, the whole thing. Viewed from the distance, it had looked quite fine. Dedicating herself to the service of humanity was how it had presented itself to her in the garden of Mewden, a twinkling labyrinth of Paris at her feet, its sordid byways hidden beneath its myriad lights. She had not bargained for the dedication involving the loss of her self-respect. They did not talk as much they had thought they would. He was not very helpful on the Carlton question. There was so much to be said, both for and against. It might be better to wait and see how circumstances shaped themselves. She thought his speech excellent. It was difficult to discover any argument against it. He seemed to be more interested in looking at her when he thought she was not noticing. That little faint vague fear came back to her and stayed with her, but brought no quickening of her pulse. It was a fear of something ugly. She had the feeling they were both acting, that everything depended upon their not forgetting the parts. In handing things to one another, they were both of them so careful that their hands should not meet and touch. They walked together back to Westminster 
and wished each other a short good night upon what once had been their common doorstep. With a latch key in her hand, she turned and watched his retreating figure, and suddenly a wave of longing seized her to run after him and call him back, to see his eyes light up and feel the pressure of his hands. It was only by clinging to the railings and counting till she was sure he had entered his own house round the corner and closed the door behind him that she restrained herself. It was a frightened face that looked at her out of the glass as she stood before it, taking off her hat. She decided that their future meetings should be at his own house. Mrs. Phillips' only complaint was that she knocked at the door too seldom. I don't know what I should do without you. I really don't, confessed the grateful lady. If ever I become a Prime Minister's wife, it's you I shall have to thank. You've got so much courage yourself, you can put the heart into him. I never had any pluck to spare myself. She concluded by giving Joan a hug, accompanied by a sloppy but heartfelt kiss. She would stand behind Phillips's chair and her fat arms around his neck, nodding her approval and encouragement, while Joan, seated opposite, would strain every nerve to keep her brain fixed upon the argument, never daring to look at poor Phillips's wretched face with its pleading, apologetic eyes, lest she should burst into hysterical laughter. She hoped she was being helpful and inspiring. Mrs. Phillips would assure her afterwards that she had been wonderful. As for herself, there were periods when she hadn't the faintest idea about what she was talking. Sometimes Mrs. Phillips, called away by domestic duty, would leave them, returning full of excuses just as they had succeeded in forgetting her. It was evident she was under the impression that her presence was useful to them, making it easier for them to open up their minds to one another. Don't you be put off by his seeming a bit unresponsive, Mrs. Phillips would explain. He's shy with women. What I am trying to do is to make him feel you are one of the family. And don't you take any notice of me, further explained the good woman, when I seem to be in opposition like. I chip in now and then on purpose just to keep the ball rolling. It stirs him up, a bit of contradictoriness. You have to live with a man before you understand him. One morning, Joan received a letter from Phillips, marked immediate. He informed her that his brain was becoming addled. He intended that afternoon to give it a draught of fresh air. He would be at the Robinwood Gate in Richmond Park at three o'clock. Perhaps the gods would be good to him. He would wait there for half an hour to give them a chance anyway. She slipped the letter unconsciously into the bosom of her dress and sat looking out of the window. It promised to be a glorious day and London was stifling and gritty. Surely no one but an unwholesome-minded prude could jib at a walk across a park. Mrs. Phillips would be delighted to hear that she had gone. For the matter of that, she would tell her when next they met. Phillips must have seen her getting off the bus, for he came forward at once from the other side of the gate, his face radiant with boyish delight. A young man and woman, entering the park at the same time, looked at them and smiled sympathetically. Joan had no idea the park contained such pleasant byways, but for an occasional perambulator they might have been in the heart of the country. The fallow deer stole near to them with noiseless feet, regarding them out of their large gentle eyes with looks of comradeship. They paused and listened while a missile thrush from a branch close to them poured out a song of hope and courage. From quite a long way off, they could still hear his clear voice singing, telling to the young and brave his gallant message. It seemed too beautiful a day for politics. After all, politics, one has them always with one. But the spring passes. He saw her onto a bus at Kingston and himself went back by train. They agreed they would not mention it to Mrs. Phillips. Not that she would have minded. The danger was that she would want to come too, honestly thinking thereby to complete their happiness. It seemed to be tacitly understood there would be other such excursions. The summer was propitious. Phillips knew his London well and how to get away from it. There were winding lanes in Hertfordshire, Surrey Hills and Commons, deep, cool, bird-haunted woods in Buckingham. Every week there was something to look forward to, something to plan for and manoeuvre. A sense of adventure, a spice of danger, added zest. She still knocked frequently as before at the door of the hideously furnished little house in North Street, but Mrs. Phillips no longer oppressed her as some old man of the sea she could never hope to shake off from her shoulders. The flabby, foolish face, robbed of its terrors, became merely pitiful. She found herself able to be quite gentle and patient with Mrs. Phillips. 
even the sloppy kisses, she came to bear without a shudder down her spine. I know you're only doing it because you sympathize with his aims and want him to win, acknowledged the good lady, but I can't help feeling grateful to you. I don't feel how useless I am while I've got you to run to. They discussed their various plans for the amelioration and improvement of humanity, but there seemed less need for haste than they had thought. The world, Joan discovered, was not so sad a place as she had judged it. They were chubby, rogue-eyed children, whistling lads and smiling maidens, kindly men with ruddy faces, happy mothers crooning over gurgling babies. There was no call to be fretful and vehement. They would work together in patience and in confidence. God's son was everywhere. It needed only that dark places should be opened up and it would enter. Sometimes, seated on a lichened log or on the short grass of some sloping hillside, looking down upon some quiet valley, they would find they had been holding hands while talking. It was but as two happy, thoughtless children might have done. They would look at one another with frank, clear eyes and smile. Once, when their pathway led through a littered farmyard, he had taken her up in his arms and carried her, and she had felt a glad pride in him that he had borne her lightly as if she had been a child, looking up at her and laughing. An old bent man passed from his work and watched them. Lean more over him, missy, he advised her. That's the way. Many a mile I've carried my lass like that in flood time and never felt a weight. Often, on returning home, not knowing why, she would look into the glass. It seemed to her that the girlhood she had somehow missed was awakening in her, taking possession of her, changing her. The lips she had always seen pressed close and firm were growing curved, leaving a little parting, as though they were not quite so satisfied with one another. The level brows were becoming slightly raised. It gave her a questioning look that was new to her. The eyes beneath were less confident. They seemed to be seeking something. One evening, on her way home from a theatre, she met Flossie. Can't stop now, said Flossie, who was hurrying. But I want to see you. Most particular. Was going to look you up. Will you be at home tomorrow afternoon at tea time? There was a distinct challenge in Flossie's eye as she asked the question. Joan felt herself flush and thought a moment. Yes, she answered. Will you be coming alone? That's the idea, answered Flossie. A heart-to-heart -heart talk between you and me and nobody else. Half past four. Don't forget. Joan walked on slowly. She had the worried feeling with which, once or twice, when a schoolgirl, she had crawled up the stairs to bed after the headmistress had informed her that she would see her in private room at eleven o'clock the next morning, leaving her to guess what about. It occurred to her in Trafalgar Square that she had promised to take tea with the Graysons the next afternoon to meet some big port from America. She would have to get out of that. She felt it wouldn't do to put off Flossie. She went back to bed, wakeful. It was marvellously like being at school again. What could Flossie want to see her about that was so important? She tried to pretend to herself that she didn't know. After all, perhaps it wasn't that. But she knew that it was the instant Flossie put up her hands in order to take off her hat. Flossie always took off her hat when she meant to be unpleasant. It was a way of pulling up her sleeves. They had their tea first. They seemed both agreed that that would be best. And then Flossie pushed back a chair and sat up. She had just the headmistress expression. Joan wasn't quite sure she ought not to stand. But controlling the instinct, she leant back in a chair and tried to look defiant without feeling it. How far are you going? demanded Flossie. Joan was not in a comprehending mood. If you're going the whole hog, that's something I can understand continued Flossie. If not, you'd better pull up. What do you mean by the whole hog? questioned Joan, assuming dignity. Oh, don't come the kid, advised Flossie. If you don't mind being talked about yourself, you might think of him. If Carlton gets hold of it, he's done for. A little bird whispers to me that Robert Phillips was seen walking across Richmond Park the other afternoon in company with Miss Joan Alway, formerly one of her contributors. Is that going to end his political career? retorted Joan with fine sarcasm. Flossie fixed a relentless eye upon her. He'll wait till the bird has got a bit more than that to whisper to him, she suggested. There'll be nothing more, explained Joan. So long as my friendship is of any assistance to Robert Phillips in his work, he's going to have it. What use we are going to be in politics? 
What's all the fuss about if men and women mustn't work together for their common aims and help one another? Why can't he help in his own house instead of wandering all about the country? Flossie wanted to know. So I do, John defended herself. I'm in and out there till I'm sick of the hideous place. You haven't seen the inside. And his wife knows all about it and is only too glad. Does she know about Richmond Park and the other places? asked Flossie. She wouldn't mind if she did, explained John. And you know what she's like. How can one think what one's saying with that silly, goggle-eyed face in front of one always? Flossie, since she had become engaged, had acquired quite a matronly train of thought. She spoke kindly with a little grave shake of her head. My dear, she said, the wife is always in the way. You'd feel just the same whatever her face was like. Joan grew angry. If you choose to suspect evil, of course you can. She answered with hauteur. But you might have known me better. I admire the man and sympathize with him. All the things I dream of are the things he's working for. I can do more good by helping and inspiring him. She wished she had not let slip the word inspire. She knew that Flossie would fasten upon it. Then I can ever accomplish by myself. And I mean to do it. She really did feel defiant now. I know, dear, agreed Flossie. You have both of you made up your mind it shall always remain a beautiful union of twin spirits. Unfortunately, you have both got bodies, rather attractive bodies. We'll keep it off that plane, if you don't mind, answered Joan with a touch of severity. I'm willing enough, answered Flossie. But what about old Mother Nature? She's going to be in this, you know. Take off your glasses and look at it straight, she went on, without giving Joan time to reply. What is it in us that inspires men? If it's only advice and sympathy he's after, what's wrong with dear old Mrs. Denton? She's a good walker, except now and then when she's got a lumbago. Why doesn't he get her to inspire him? It isn't only that, explained Joan. I give him courage. I always did have more of that than in any use to a woman. He wants to be worthy of my belief in him. What is the arm if he does admire me? If a smile from me or a touch of the hand can urge him to fresh effort? Suppose he does love me. Flossie interrupted. How about being quite frank? She suggested. Suppose we do love one another. How about putting it that way? And suppose we do? Agreed Joan, her courage rising. Why should we shun one another? As if we are both of us incapable of decency or self-control? Why must love be always assumed to make us weak and contemptible? As if it were some subtle poison? Why shouldn't it strengthen and ennoble us? Why did the apple fall? Answered Flossie. Why, when it escapes from its bonds, doesn't it soar upward? If it wasn't for the irritating law of gravity, we could skip about on the brink of precipices without danger. Things being what they are, sensible people keep as far away from the edge as possible. I'm sorry, she continued. Awfully sorry, old girl. It's a bit of rotten bad luck for both of you. You were just made for one another. And fate, knowing what was coming, bustles round and gets hold of poor, silly Mrs. Phillips so as to be able to say, yeah, unless it all comes right in the end, she added musingly, and the poor old soul pecks out. I wouldn't give much for a liver. That's not bringing me up well, suggested John, putting those ideas into my head. Oh, well, one can't help one's thoughts, explained Flossie. It would be a blessing all round. They had risen. Joan folded her hands. Thank you for your scolding, ma'am, she said. Shall I write out a hundred lines of Greek? Or do you think it will be sufficient if I promise never to do it again? You mean it, said Flossie. Of course, you will go on seeing him, visiting them and all that. But you won't go gadding about so that people can talk? Wally through the bars in future, she promised, with the jailer between us. She put her arms round Flossie and bent her head so that her face was hidden. Flossie still seemed troubled. She held on to Joan. You are sure of yourself? she asked. We are only the female of the species. We get hungry and thirsty too. You know that kitty, don't you? Joan laughed without raising her face. Yes, ma'am, I know that, she answered. I'll be good. She sat in the dusk after Flossie had gone and the laboured breathing of the tired city came to her through the open window. She had rather fancied that Mata is grown. It had not looked so very heavy, the thorns not so very alarming, as seen through the window. She would wear it bravely. It would rather become her. Facing the mirror of the days to come, she tried it on. It was going to hurt. There was no doubt of that. 
she saw the fatuous approving face of the eternal mrs phillips thrust ever between them against the background of that hideous furniture of those bilious wallpapers the loneliness that would ever walk with her sit down beside her in the crowded restaurant steal up the staircase with her creep step by step with her from room to room the ever unsatisfied yearning for a tender word a kindly touch yes it was going to hurt poor robert it would be hard on him too she could not help feeling consolation in the thought that he also would be wearing that invisible crown she must write to him the sooner it was done the better half a dozen contradictory moods passed over her during the composing of that letter but to her they seemed but the unfolding of a single thought on one page it might have been his mother writing to him an experienced sagacious lady quite aware in spite of her affection for him of his faults and weaknesses solicitous that he should avoid the dangers of an embarrassing entanglement his happiness being the only consideration of importance on others it might have been a queen laying her immutable commands upon some loyal subject sworn to her service part of it might have been written by a laughing philosopher who had learned the folly of taking life too seriously knowing that all things pass that the tears of today will be remembered with a smile and a part of it was the unconsidered language of a loving woman and those were the pages that he kissed his letter in answer was much shorter of course he would obey her wishes he had been selfish thinking only of himself as for his political career he did not see how that was going to suffer by his being occasionally seen in company with one of the most brilliantly intellectual women in london known to share his views and he did not care if it did but inasmuch as she valued it all things should be sacrificed to it it was hers to do what she would with it was the only thing he had to offer her their meetings became confined as before to the little house in north street but it really seemed as if the gods appeased by the submission had decided to be kind hilda was home for the holidays and her piercing eyes took in the situation at a flash she appeared to have returned with a newborn and exacting affection for her mother that astonished almost as much as it delighted the poor lady feeling sudden desire for walk or a bus ride or to be taken to an entertainment no one was of any use to hilda but her mother daddy had his silly politics to think and talk about he must worry them out alone or with the assistance of miss alway that was what she was there for mrs phillips torn between a sense of duty and fear of losing this new happiness would yield to the child's coaxing often they would be left alone to discuss the nation's needs uninterrupted conscientiously they would apply themselves to the task always to find that sooner or later they were looking at one another in silence one day phillips burst into a curious laugh they had been discussing the problem of the small holder joan had put a question to him and with a slight start he had asked her to repeat it but it seemed she had forgotten it i had to see a solicitor one morning he explained when i was secretary to a miners union up north a point had arisen concerning the legality of certain payments it was a matter of vast importance to us but he didn't seem to be taking any interest and suddenly he jumped up i'm sorry phillips he said but i've got a big trouble of my own on at home i guess you know what and i don't seem to care a damn about yours you'd better see delony if you're in a hurry and i did he turned and leant over his desk i guess they'll have to find another leader if they are in a hurry he added i don't seem able to think about turnips and cows don't make me feel i've interfered with your work only to spoil it said john i guess i'm spoiling yours too he answered i'm not worth it i might have done something to win you and keep you i'm not going to do much without you you mean my friendship is going to be of no use to you asked john he raised his eyes and fixed them on her with a pleading dog-like look for god's sake don't take even that from me he said unless you want me to go to pieces altogether a crust does just keep one alive one can't help thinking what a fine strong chap one might be if one wasn't always hungry she felt so sorry for him he looked such a boy with the angry tears in his clear blue eyes and that little childish quivering of the kind strong sulky mouth she rose and took his head between her hands and turned his face towards her she had meant to scold him but changed her mind and laid his head against her breast and held it there he clung to her as a troubled child might with arms clasped round her and his head against her breast and a mist rose up before her 
and strange commanding voices seemed calling to her. He could not see her face. She watched it herself with dim half-consciousness as it changed before her in the tawdry mirror above the mantelpiece, half longing that he might look up and see it, half terrified lest he should. With an effort that seemed to turn her into stone, she regained command over herself. I must go now, she said in a harsh voice, and he released her. I am afraid I am an awful nuisance to you, he said. I get these moods at times. You're not angry with me? No, she answered with a smile. But it'll hurt me if you fail. Remember that. She turned down the embankment after leaving the house. She always found the river strong and restful. So it was not only the bad women that needed to be afraid of themselves. Even to the most high-class young woman with letters after her name and altruistic interests. Even to her also the longing for lover's clasp. Flossie had been right. Mother Nature was not to be flouted of her children, not even of her new daughters, to them, likewise, the family trait. She would have run away if she could, leaving him to guess at her real reason, if he were smart enough, but that would have meant excuses and explanations all round. She was writing a daily column of notes for Grayson now, in addition to the weekly letter from Clorinda, and Mrs. Tenton, having compromised with her first dreams, was delegating to Joan more and more of her work. She wrote to Mrs. Phillips that she was feeling unwell and would be unable to lunch with them on the Sunday as had been arranged. Mrs. Phillips, much disappointed, suggested Wednesday, but it seemed on Wednesday she was no better, and so it drifted on for about a fortnight without her finding the courage to come to any decision, and then one morning, turning the corner into Abingdon Street, she felt a slight pull at her sleeve, and Hilda was beside her. The child had shown an uncanny intuition in not knocking at the door. Joan had been fearing that and would have sent down word that she was out, but it had to be faced. Are you never coming again? asked the child. Of course, answered Joan, but I'm better. I'm not very well just now. It's a weather, I suppose. The child turned her head as they walked and looked at her. Joan felt herself smarting under that look, but persisted. I'm very much run down, she said. I may have to go away. You promise to help him, said the child. I can't if I'm ill, retorted Joan. Besides, I'm helping him. There are other ways of helping people than by wasting the time talking to them. He wants you, said the child. It's your being there that helps him. Joan stopped and turned. Did he send you? she asked. No, the child answered. Mama had a headache this morning and I slipped out. You're not keeping your promise. Palace Yard, save for a statuesque policeman, was empty. How do you know that my being with him helps him? asked Joan. You know things when you love anybody, explained the child. You feel them. You will come again soon? Joan did not answer. You're frightened, the child continued in a passionate low voice. You think that people will talk about you and look down upon you. You ought not to think about yourself. You ought to think only about him and his work. Nothing else matters. I'm thinking about him and his work, Joan said. A hand sought Hilda's and held it. There are things you don't understand. Men and women can't help each other in the way you think. They may try to and mean no harm in the beginning, but the harm comes and then not only the woman but the man also suffers and his work is spoiled and his life ruined. The small, hot hand clasped Jones convulsively. But he won't be able to do his work if you keep away and never come back to him, she persisted. Oh, I know it. It all depends upon you. He wants you and I want him, if that's any consolation to you. Joan answered with a short laugh. It wasn't much of a confession. The child was cute enough to have found that out for herself. Wally, you see, I can't have him, and there's an end of it. They had reached the abbey. Joan turned, and they retraced their steps slowly. I shall be going away soon for a little while, she said. The talk had helped her to decision. When I come back, I'll come and see you all and you must all come and see me now and then. I expect I shall have a flat of my own. My father may be coming to live with me. Goodbye. Do all you can to help him. She stooped and kissed the child, straining her to her almost fiercely, but the child's lips were cold. She did not look back. Miss Grayson was sympathetic towards her desire for a longish holiday and wonderfully helpful, and Mrs. Tenton also approved, and to Joan's surprise kissed her. Mrs. Tenton was not given to kissing. She wired to her father 
and got his reply the same evening. He would be at her rooms on the day she had fixed with his travelling bag and at her ladyship's orders, with love and many thanks, he had added. She waited till the day before starting to run round and say goodbye to the Phillipses. She felt it would be unwise to try and get out of doing that. Both Phillips and Hilda, she was thankful, were out, and she and Mrs. Phillips had tea alone together. The talk was difficult so far as Joan was concerned. If the woman had been possessed of ordinary intuition, she might have arrived at the truth. Joan almost wished she would. It would make her own future task the easier. But Mrs. Phillips, it was clear, was going to be no help to her. For her father's sake, she made pretense of eagerness, but as the sea widened between her and the harbour lights, it seemed as if a part of herself were being torn away from her. They had travelled leisurely through Holland and the Rhineland, and that helped a little, the new scenes and interests, and in Switzerland they discovered a delightful little village in an upland valley with just one small hotel, and decided to stay there for a while so as to give themselves time to get their letters. They took long walks and climbs, returning tired and hungry, looking forward to the dinner and the evening talk with a few other guests on the veranda. The days passed restfully in that hidden valley. The great white mountains closed her in. They seemed so strong and clean. It was in the morning they were leaving that a telegram was put into her hands. Mrs. Phillips was ill at lodgings in Folkestone. She hoped that Joan, on her way back, would come to see her. She showed the telegram to her father. Do you mind, Dad, if we go straight back? She asked. No, dear, he answered, if you wish it. I would like to go back, she said. The End of Chapter 12